Welcome and good morning, everyone from Washington, DC. Thank you so much for joining us for today's policy briefing, the EU strategy for Indo-Pacific engagement, featuring Mr. George Cunningham, former strategic advisor for the Asia Pacific Department of the European External Service. My name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa USA. Sasakawa USA is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Our activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the engagement of exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Today's event is being recorded and is on the record. A recap and video recording will be made available on Sasakawa USA's website in the coming weeks. There will be time for Q&A later in the program. You can submit your questions at any time throughout the program using the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom of your screen. And uh, with that, I would like to pass the program over to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa USA. Good morning. I am Satohiro Akimoto, President and Chairman of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I'm delighted to see you all. Thank you very much for attending. Today's event is a little different from our usual policy briefing series. While we often talk about geostrategic issues in the Indo-Pacific region from the viewpoint of the US, Japan, and Asian countries, today we are bringing the European Union in the discussion, reflecting Western Europe's rapidly increasing strategic interest in the Indo-Pacific region. It is actually a remarkable development that in the Pacific has become part of daily policy related conversation in Brussels and other capitals around the Europe. I am delighted to have Mr. George Cunningham today. He has worked for EU across most major policy issues during his 30 year service. He retired as a strategic advisor on Asia Pacific affairs at the Europe External Action Service July of last year. I'm not going to read his entire biography to save time for discussion, but allow me to say just one thing. He is an active, energetic, and a creative thinker, as you can tell from the fact that in his youth, he walked 9,000 kilometers from Alexandria, Egypt, all the way to Cape Town, South Africa. Not many people would do that. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA launched eight paper publication series titled Europe's Evolving Strategic Vision for Indo-Pacific Last Fall. The genesis of this publication series was a European panel discussion, which I attended as a panelist together with Mr. Cunningham. Therefore, I am glad that the Sasakawa USA published Mr. Cunningham's paper titled the EU Strategy for Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific to kick off publication of eight papers. The second paper, Australia's Views of Europe in Europe in Indo-Pacific, Potential for Balance by Ms. Susanna Patton of Lowy Institute in Sydney has just been published as a second paper of the series. With that, Mr. Cunningham, floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, America. Good evening, Japan. Good evening, friends everywhere. And indeed, uh, there is a great need for uh, friends in this uh, world that we're living in, um, because of, of course, we are seeing a naked aggression uh, in, uh, by Russia uh, in Ukraine. And um, I'm going to start straight away uh, to first of all thank, of course, the Sasakawa Foundation and uh, Mr. Akimoto uh, for having me on board, but to switch straight away to this particular issue, which is an example, if I may say, of uh, great like-minded cooperation by partners um, with, by Europe and the Indo-Pacific. So if we switch to the slides now, please. Thank you very much indeed. So that's the talk. So looking first, change slides, that's it. So actually, it's really, what, one of the things that's really interesting um, is the cooperation that has developed amongst the like-minded. And of course, we have good partners in Indo-Pacific. And you can see here all the ones, 
all the countries that have joined, including, of course, um, in, in support of the, the work, of course, of the 27 countries of the European Union in imposing sanctions against Russia. And I'm also pleased to say that I have um, heard today that Singapore has made a similar move. Um, and so most of the financial centers now uh, are aligned on this particular issue. Um, so I'm sure that all of us wish the best for the Ukrainian people. And you can see, I think, that the West has become much more determined in the last few days in support of Ukraine, uh, given the atrocious atrocities being committed by Russia. So next slide. I should say, by the way, of course, on the previous slide, two things. One is Taiwan is there which I think is very interesting and uh, important. And also that India is not there. And as you know, India has a close relationship uh, with Russia and it's in, the, um, in a kind of a camp in the middle, uh, on the one hand, um, wanting assistance uh, given the situation, territorial claims of China, and on the other hand, um, supporting Russia. And that is, uh, um, something complicated, complex, uh, that needs to be perhaps resolved with a bit of diplomacy to see whether India can start uh, changing uh, its, its position on that. Thank you. Next slide. Of course, um, this has all been happening since um, the strategy. The strategy, of course, didn't envisage something like this happening. Uh, and either indeed uh, the ministerial that took place by the EU French presidency on the Indo-Pacific uh, just a few days ago before the invasion, again, you know, people were hoping, of course, that um, there would be a, some kind of resolution of the, uh, the standoff. Okay, so first thing to say to good colleagues in the uh, United States and in Japan is that we have uh, a complicated, as you well know, <laughs> European Union system. Uh, but to simplify things, each member state uh, takes turns to be for six months to be uh, president. So therefore, a presidency comes up for each country now with 27 members uh, every 13 and a half years. But it, as it happens, France is holding the EU rotating presidency and France is the uh, sole um, European power that has a presence in the Indo-Pacific region. It has um, 7,000 troops, it has uh, uh, naval bases, of course, in the Pacific, um, and it has um, territories, and I think it has one and a half million citizens. So it has a big stake there. And by good coincidence, uh, France, that has been very much behind the EU strategy and cooperation in the Pacific, um, is holding the presidency and able, therefore, with great enthusiasm, to take things forward. So the ministerial attendance, which was a physical event, incorporated a lot of Indo Pacific partners five Indo-Pacific regional organizations, the European Investment Bank, and the four overseas, overseas communities and territories. And the aim was to reaffirm the EU's engagement and strong political and economic interests in the Indo-Pacific based on the EU strategy. And that meeting con uh, concentrated in three areas, connectivity, global issues, which are incorporated climate, health, biodiversity, and oceans, and security and defense. So how did this all come about? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Well, of course, I'm not going to dwell on this too long because we all know the importance of the region. You, many of you come from the region, of course. But just to say that actually the European Union, the 27 together, is the number one investor. It is larger in investment terms than the United States and much larger than China, which, which is a relative newcomer. Uh, it's the top development assistance provider. And when we talk about you know, burden sharing in the United States says, for instance, you know, whether you, the uh, Europe is not spending uh, enough on defense. Well, we do a lot on development assistance, much more than the United States. And so in a sense, there's a kind of quid pro quo in terms of what we're prepared to do and what others are prepared to do. But nonetheless, as you've heard, of course, now Germany has very much upped its game concerning military expenditures. So we can see Europe perhaps being uh, in a different position. We're amongst the biggest traders, 1.5 trillion units, approximately the same trade flow as the United States has with the region. I think it was 1.7 trillion US dollars. It's pretty much the same in terms of currency conversion. 
Uh, but one of the critical things that to say is that we define the Indo-Pacific as stretching from the east coast of Africa to the Pacific Island States. So actually the United States and the Americas are not included in our definition of the Indo-Pacific. So as we all know the importance of the region, I won't dwell on that, and we all recognize that there's great geopolitical uh, competition, um, increase in expenditure, of course, military expenditure of China is driving the increase in military expenditures of other countries. Um, and uh, DPRK that uh, only yesterday decided to remind us of its existence uh, by launching another missile, where there's many potentials for uh, big trouble, South China Sea, East China Sea, of course, well known, many, many at Taiwan, of course. So we're concerned because, of course, the amounts of um, of goods um, flowing uh, from the uh, Indo-Pacific into Europe and in this globalized world that is full of uh, intertangled uh, supply chains means that we have to take a, an interest in the region because this is a region for prosperity. This is the future of the world. We hope it will, <laughs> we won't have um, uh, knock-on effects that's gonna cause all kinds of problems in all kinds of regions. But anyway, in this particular case, of course, we are very hopeful and uh, sure that um, the region will continue to be prosperous despite COVID-19 and everything else. And that's why we have to take a great interest in the security of the region. Next slide. So the strategy is uh, relatively new. It uh, came about actually very quickly in the span of uh, 2021. Um, and it was adopted in September. There was actually uh, the 27 foreign ministers of the European Union in April gave the, uh, let's say, the political direction for the European Commission, which is our um, civil service, to produce the strategy. And it was produced in September, uh, just as uh, the United States president has a State of the Union address coming up this week. Uh, the European Commission president in, in her September Union address um, had it as part of the package of things she wanted to talk about. So elevated to that kind of level uh, and importance in terms of the European Union. This of course follows many other partners that have adopted at different times Indo-Pacific strategies. You can see the list there as a reminder. Uh, so uh, you might say that you came a bit late on the table, but on the other hand, there was of course many reasons. Uh, one was of course concerns about uh, China and China's reaction to such a thing. This has dissipated uh, in Europe uh, because of uh, Chinese uh, moves against Hong Kong and uh, various uh, measures that China has been taking, which has uh, quite frankly really upset uh, Europeans um, to the degree, of course, that uh, we've had, uh, we put sanctions on uh, China because of Xinjiang. They put uh, sanctions back on us, much more uh, widespread sanctions. Um, and if you look at public opinion, look at the paper I wrote, it has a graphic to show the decline of favorability ratings of China in Europe. So this plus the fact that ASEAN in 2019 produced its outlook, which was not anti-China, because of course the terminology Indo-Pacific is sometimes used as an anti-China terminology, but ASEAN showed the way in that you could have a very neutral Indo-Pacific approach. And so one of the unique features of the, um, the uh, European Union uh, Indo-Pacific approach is that China is hardly mentioned in the paper. We'll come back to that in a minute. So anyway, the, it got going, the idea got going with France, Germany, and Netherlands. Um, and then there was pressure about uh, from them and other member states saying, okay, now it's up to the European Union. We don't want to have all these separate strategies. Let's have one combined strategy for the region. And the last game changer, of course, was the change in the US administration. The EU really wanted to build up, rebuild uh, transatlantic relations, and it produced a policy paper called the New EU US Agenda for Global Change, which declared that there'd be an increased focus on the challenges and opportunities in the Pacific region to, to help develop cooperation with like minded partners. Next slide, please. So we have to have, um, it, for whatever reason on board, we have to have a strategy that is inclusive of all partners wishing to cooperate with the European Union. So no partner is left up. 
And so therefore, what we've done in the strategy is that we've created this kind of palette of many, many areas where there can be cooperation, because of course, the first and foremost, all of us, all of us on this call want cooperation with all the partners in the region, where we can find common ground. And one of the important things that had to be said in the paper in a kind of indirect way, let's say, was that um, this common ground can be based on shared principles, values, or mutual interest, not and mutual interest, which meant that we, were, we are open to cooperate with partners who don't necessarily have quite the same level of values that we expect of them, but who are together with us going to work on solving many of the problems facing the world and, and, and facing maybe even the bilateral relationships between the EU and the partner countries. So it's, it's an open book ready for work, depending on each policy area. So we have to define what are the interests for each policy area. And the EU's approach is consistent concerning China with the EU 2019 strategic outlook, which was the document that first uh, came out with the phrase systemic rival when it came to China to remind we want to continue working with everybody in a cooperative manner. This is also certainly the case. And we have defined in the strategic outlook um, our cooperation, depending on the policy area with China, cooperation, um, uh, uh, competitive or systemic rival. Negotiating partner is the, is the point. So it goes um, cooperative, negotiating, uh, competitive, strategic rival. And uh, so we have a strategy that is very inclusive, but we have, however, said, however, that we will deepen our engagement and particularly with those partners that have already announced Indo-Pacific approaches of their own. And you've seen that list before, and that means, of course, that um, these are the countries which are, of course, in many cases, like-minded or are neutral, uh, such as ASEAN, which, which the EU has a lot of cooperation with and wants to keep building that cooperation. Next slide, please. So uh, we have this uh, broad-based palette, and so the strategy is uh, split into uh, seven chapters. You can see them there. It's a wide ranging areas. Sustainable and inclusive prosperity, of course, is your trade and investment. That comes number one. Green transition, of course, that is the externalization of the internal policies of the European Union. So we are doing a green transition within the European Union and we want to encourage others to do the green transition. Then we have ocean governance, which has a lot to do with also our concerns with fisheries not just the obvious, um, but fisheries. And one of the things that you'll see that so we are doing is joining all the fisheries organizations. We've already got membership of a lot of them, but we're going to complete our trawl uh, to, uh, to ensure that illegal uh, and unreported um, fisheries are, the, the, the level of that is, is as curtailed as possible for sustainability. Digital governance, we'll come back to that because that's becoming more and more important. Connectivity, uh, a lot of importance for by the United States and Japan concerning um, uh, how we can uh, connect better. Um, and uh, we have Build Back Better from the United States as a new initiative. Uh, we also have new initiatives from the European Union. Security and defense comes towards the end because we don't want to really emphasize that as being so you know, vital, but of course, there's a lot to be said there. And then the human security, which is health systems because of COVID-19 in our joint work to assist when it comes to the vaccines. Human rights, of course, very, very important where we are. We are losing ground in the Asia, in the Indo-Pacific. So there's more that should be done. We have a new sanctions regime, which we're using quite a lot of at the moment, um, but still more thought has to be given as to how to improve the lives of ordinary people their human rights um, in the Indo-Pacific region. And of course, disaster risk reduction, where the EU has been a major player since 1997. And all this is underpinned by partnerships, dialogues, and other means in which we can work together. And of course, in particular, multilateral forum, where multilateralism is one of the key component parts of the strategy, of course, as well. Next slide, please. So as I said before, China is not the focus of the strategy. Actually, it's pretty absent. Just one paragraph kind of commenting. And then basically um, it's all about 
take advantage of the great region, the great Indo-Pacific region as a whole. Don't put your eggs in all one basket. Um, there's a fantastic growth taking place everywhere. Engender that growth and make the most of it, both for the citizens of the Indo-Pacific and the citizens of, of the European Union. Diversification. So what we've done in the strategy as well is, if you read it, is that we have identified the partners in all those areas that we think we want, that they, we want to cooperate with. Or, you know, there are places where we can cooperate together, areas, policy areas that we can cooperate together. So you'll see in the strategy very concretely countries listed. That doesn't mean that those countries that are not listed are not uh, open, you know, we're not open for them to join, join in, but they should now step forward. They should see what is happening, what the opportunities are within the strategy for cooperation and come forward with ideas uh, for that cooperation. Then of course, because of the uh, disruptions that are taking place, uh, we need to build a more resilient and sustainable global value chains, supply chains, all that is very an important part of the strategy mentioned in the strategy as a way, as, as a topic that has to be tackled rather than necessarily tackling that topic. And I think that's something that again has to be developed with Indo-Pacific partners. Then of course, one of the, uh, the things that people talk about the European Union is uh, that it's very important in terms of setting standards and norms around the world. So we want to keep that um, important uh, job going. We are they say we are text, some people say we're text standard and norms, superpower. Um, and of course, we want to ensure that all those standards and norms are in line with universal values. As I said, you know, the first thing was um, the issue of prosperity. And there is a large trade component in the strategy and, and identify exactly what the priorities are. Australia, New Zealand, complete negotiations, then India, came on board with the idea of a possible a free trade agreement. It's going to be very difficult to do with India, but um, in the EU-India summit that took place some a month after the uh, foreign ministers gave their go-ahead for an Indo-Pacific strategy. So already in May, India at the summit with the EU showed an interest, or, you know, which was not there before concerning an FTA. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, then with uh, mentions of what people want to do in, in the longer term. But of course, it does require these kind of things are not easy to negotiate and do require give and take on, on both sides. So these are, you know, long term up from Australia and New Zealand, which is not far away from completion. Uh, the rest are a little bit longer term in terms of, you know, being able to actually achieve it. But anyway, there is a, a big agenda. There is no um, desire at the moment for the European Union to involve themselves in any of the, you know, multilateral regional um, uh, trade um, uh, configurations that are taking place at the moment in the Indo-Pacific region. Economic partnership agreements, we're at the moment negotiating what is called the Cotonou Agreement of the African Pacific um, countries and Caribbean countries. Uh, so opportunities lie again for bolstering uh, aspects of this for the Pacific and the East African community, bearing in mind, of course, that our strategy goes from the East Coast of, of Africa uh, eastward. Um, then we have in our areas, particularly uh, green and uh, digital and connectivity, we're looking for partnerships. A number of partnerships have already ha taken place. We'll come to that in a minute. And then very importantly, Horizon Europe Research and Development Corporation with the like-minded. Um, there has been, um, there's going to be an intensification of collaboration with the like-minded in this particular field. Again, it comes at a time, it's an interesting time, this whole strategy, it comes at a time when we are actually uh, going into a new budget cycle for the whole European Union, which meant that the Indo-Pacific caught the tails of this and has managed to therefore make its marks so that it can access funding for uh, partners in, in many fairs, uh, uh, in many policy areas. Thank you, next one. Right, now, Security supports economic prosperity. The first thing to say, of course, as you all know, uh, we don't have a military. The European Union does not have a military. Although for the first time, extraordinarily, actually, because of this Ukraine crisis, and it's always the European Union advances, you know, in terms of its unity, in terms of its uh, purpose, let's say, 
when there is a crisis, <laughs> because it forces people to think that they have to do things differently. Uh, and so actually it's the first time that uh, the European Union is providing military assistance uh, as European Union um, to anyone. It's just what's happened. It's an enormous step for the European Union to go into that field in that way, kind of way. So at the moment, of course, it's a bit like NATO. Um, it's, um, you have different countries. Some of them are NATO members. Some of them are not NATO members of the European Union, who are European Union member states. Um, and it's up to every country with their own national uh, resources to decide what, what they do. Sovereignty retained is retained by member states. However, the EU does do coordination and, and get people together to do things. And so the, um, there was an advance made uh, in this strategy concerning, you've seen there, quotation marks, a meaningful European naval presence in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, which is the first time that, uh, if you like, um, the, the concept of um, involvement of naval forces in the Indo-Pacific comes forward. Now, of course, we've had this operation Atalanta, which has been focused on Somali piracy, but this is a little bit more uh, than that. Um, so therefore, the, the idea is to enhance EU member state naval deployments, albeit the navies are not very large, as you well know, except for the French to help protect sea lines of communication and FOIP and UNCLOS. Um, and of course, we're doing a lot of work as well on uh, boosting Indo-Pacific partners' maritime security capacity and uh, maritime awareness and so on and so forth. And again, it's not just to do with military, it's to do with fisheries and uh, other and piracy, anti-piracy and so on. We're not focused necessarily so much, as much on, on the military side. So joint exercises, port calls, encouraging Indo-Pacific to come to us and for operations to go together using that EU Naval Force Operation Atalanta, which is operating off the coast of uh, Somalia. Um, one of the things is that we've we are opened the door for um, Indo-Pacific partners to participate in the EU's common security and defense missions. To explain to you, there are 18 missions uh, uh, of the European Union uh, around the world. Many of them are police missions. We are kind of police providers, as well as military trainers and so on, but police advisors. For instance, in Afghanistan, there was uh, quite a large uh, police um, training uh, mission um, that uh, went on until 2016 um, with a something with uh, participation. So anyway, what we're saying here is that you know, we're open, we don't have to just have European Union uh, member states uh, providing assistance. There can be small scale assistance, three, four, five personnel or whatever, um, but it would be good again to have this uh, ability to mix and, and work together. Strengthen cooperation, certain partners on counterterrorism, cybersecurity, maritime security and crisis management. There's a special, um, there's a special program for that, which we'll come to in a minute aim to expand its security defense dialogues, of course, stronger participation in ASEAN regional forum. And then we are deploying for the first time, the European Union is deploying uh, military advisors, um, which are the equivalent of defense attaches, but it's again, a big step for the European Union because we're not normally involved in that kind of stuff at the EU delegations in Beijing and Jakarta. Next slide. So, well, if you look carefully, at this 17 page strategy, how many times is Japan mentioned? Actually, Japan is, I would say, I'm not having done word counts, but <laughs> having been involved in writing of this thing, is actually the, the top uh, cooperative partner with the European Union in the Indo Pacific, according to the strategy. There's 17, 117 mentions of the uh, EU Japan. Um, and uh, we have some firsts. We have the first EU connectivity partnership of 2019. So that's the first time that um, Japan and the EU got together. And it was, uh, we were honored by the visit of Prime Minister Abe, who exceptionally went to Brussels a second time in one year. Uh, uh, the second time was in fact to sign this connectivity partnership. Now by connectivity, for those of you who are wondering what that is, uh, that's our terminology for your build back better. Um, it's to do with infrastructure and cooperation between us. So there was also in 2019, the world's largest free and safe data flows area was declared between the EU and Japan. Um, and um, 
at uh, we are exploring the launching of negotiations for a digital partnership agreement between the EU and Japan. And this actually happened at the French Ministry. We'll come to that as well. First Green Alliance partner of 2020, that's the Japan became the EU's first Green Alliance partner. That means that this is a high end uh, uh, partnership to secure the climate change goals that we have in mind, the Paris Agreement. Um, and basically Japan signed up for very ambitious goals in that respect. We have, uh, that was very good. Then uh, Japan's association with R&D Horizon Europe program is under discussion to strengthen that and make it more um, integrated. The implementation of the EU Japan Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, of course, is mentioned as well in the strategy. Uh, as our joint naval exercises with the EU's Operation Atalanta. And then I mentioned this enhancing security cooperation in with Asia project is SIWA. This is the one that's on counterterrorism and so on and so forth. So Japan is a partner in that with the European Union and other countries, including countries such as Vietnam, which again shows you this, what we call in the European Union pragmatic, pragmatic uh, principle pragmatism. Principle pragmatism, which means that we stick to our principles, but we cooperate as best we can with people that like us and we like them in different areas, again, based on policy. Address EU strategic dependencies by Japan, uh, partnering on semiconductors, uh, looking again at diversification. So Japan is mentioned as a, a, as a good partner to build uh, the partnership on semiconductors. And then a very practical cooperation on common alert messaging on navigation satellite system between the EU and Japan. I think it's on the EU satellite system. Um, and then of course mentioned as well about various dialogues, environment, transport, ocean affairs and fisheries, and then uh, action on plastic pollution. So actually a lot, let's be honest, a lot. Next slide. So, of course, so you've had the various stages here. You've had the, in April last year, you had the uh, 27 foreign ministers saying we want to have an Indo-Pacific strategy and giving the political guidelines what the structure should be, more or less. The commission comes up with its implementation plan. And now, of course, French presidency that's been pushing very hard for this, it becomes their, um, their, their moment in which they can actually then realize the whole thing. So. All that you've heard about was in discussion at the ministerial. When it comes to sort of concrete things coming out of that ministerial, so there was a decision taken to create the first maritime area of interest, which is going to be in northwestern Indian Ocean. And the outcome document says that it will ensure a significant European naval presence. Okay. We'll come back to the, where this has been, um, the reasons why it's there. Secondly, um, well, actually, this is just a summary of the many things, and I have just picked up the ones which I think are the ones that actually advance things uh, for your consideration. Support EU regional program for maritime security in the Red Sea, because that is part of our Indo Pacific approaches to the Red Sea, although it is not mentioned a great deal in terms of the, the Gulf. We don't mention, we don't talk about that too much in the strategy, but nonetheless, it is part of the strategy. Then we are uh, launching, there is support for the launching of negotiations with those digital partnerships. So it's going to be with Japan, Singapore, and the Republic of Korea. So that is now getting underway. There's a joint declaration on privacy was one of the outcomes and the protection of personal data. Uh, there you have the EU, Australia, Comoros, India, Japan, Mauritius, New Zealand, Republic of Korea, Singapore, and Sri Lanka, all signing up that joint uh, declaration. So many uh, projects also being discussed, including an Africa to Asia submarine cable to be built. And as a separate event, the day before the ministerial, there was a gathering of European and Indo-Pacific public development banks and financing institutions from both regions to gather, they gathered to catalyze sustainable infrastructure, public and private finance. Because one of the issues, of course, is that the way we all want to do build back better and uh, involve ourselves in connectivity is that we have to raise the money. We're not going to just, that it's going to be the public purse and increasing our own debt levels to do this, we have to have private finance. 
we have to have the banks involved to actually achieve this because it actually is a mighty piece of work. We remember that the Asia Development Bank said that over the next decade, to actually fix all the issues in the Indo-Pacific requires $1.3 trillion expenditure per year. Now, what China has spent worldwide in all its, in all its publicity is one trillion, I hasn't spent it actually, is <laughs> indebted countries to the tune of one trillion uh, US dollars with a little bit of giveaways, of course. Um, so that is actually less than one year what is actually required in the region. So but for those that say, ah, oh, it's in competition with BRI, you know, Belt and Road Initiative, you know, all the initiatives we're doing. Actually, no, there's so much space for work to do. We're not in competition. Uh, we are all together trying to get it done. And at the same time, we are trying to persuade China to improve the quality of what it's doing, if we can, <laughs> or get the governments that are concluding contracts to do their best in that respect. Next slide. So, where's the United States, you ask him? Where's the United States? Well, we have our own se separate deal with the United States on the Indo-Pacific. So the first thing to say, the whole thing initiated, of course, on the fact, or kicked off on the fact that we had a new president, a president that was prepared to cooperate with the, with the European Union again, we stored the transatlantic relations, everyone was terribly keen to, to have the United States involved in all these things and therefore in that document we already talked about the Indo-Pacific, a term by the way that was hardly used by the European Union beforehand. First time it came out really significantly apart from the connectivity, EU-Japan connectivity partnership where it was mentioned, but the first time it was mentioned in a political sense in a big way was the transatlantic um, agenda. So transatlantic agenda is top of the agenda, so we had a U.S. summit in already in June 2021. Uh, there had been a, uh, you know, a decline in summits until then. Um, and one of the things that was established at that summit was the EUS Trade and Technology Council. Then, um, after soon after the strategy was launched um, at the State of the Union address by uh, the Commission President, uh, EUS consultations on the Indo-Pacific were held in December, soon after and before the French Ministerial on the Indo-Pacific in February 22. So you can see there are very close uh, consultations taking place. And um, it is, um, and then I'm looking at the, uh, the new, um, looking at the uh, IP cooperation, uh, looking at the results of the, um, the dialogue that took place, the consultations took place in, in December. It's very lots of similarities to the EU strategy, uh, but the US seems to be um, adding two new things, which are not so much in the um, EU strategy. One is good governance, um, and the other one is countering disinformation. And there is an emphasis on quality connectivity, uh, including uh, digital. So also to acknowledge the fact the White House has just updated its US Indo Pacific strategy. And to emphasize finally that President Biden has said Europe is an actual partner for the United States because they are committed to the same global order based on democratic norms and institutions. So that close cooperation uh, very much continues. Next slide. So this is uh, really uh, to sum things up. So it, the region has welcomed uh, the EU strategy. Uh, it's considered by many to be the third way. It's not, not taking any sides, non-threatening, and therefore it's being widely welcomed. The uh, EU Asian partners are keen for the EU's involvement in the region and have a large palette of choices for their cooperation. The EU summits, of course, will, will help implement that. Uh, funding uh, it was a good uh, chance. The funding coincided with seven-year planning of the uh, budgets of the European Union, so there is money. Uh, mentions of that has been inserted into the budgetary processes so that money can be called upon from the uh, EU budget. Uh, we've had, of course, two setbacks generally. One is Brexit, which means the Royal Navy is not part of uh, European Union anymore. Uh, that asset, however, there is cooperation. For instance, the Netherlands sent a, brick, uh, a frigate uh, for during the uh, sailing of the uh, air aircraft carrier force uh, of the UK into the Indo-Pacific. There was a Netherlands uh, frigate there. 
AUKUS, there was a problem, of course, as you well know, concerning the uh, submarine deal and generally not lack of coordination. But I think a lot of um, the problems have been fixed in terms of cooperation. Of course, a, a general uh, concern by our member states is given the situation concerning Russia, which has existed for many years and has increased in, in problematic terms. Uh, the withdrawal of precious naval resources away from potential flashpoints is a concern. And this is, of course, why um, the first deployment or the first idea of um, a maritime area of interest in the Indo-Pacific is the closest possible place in the Indo-Pacific to home for the Europe, for Europe, the Northwest Indian Ocean. So anyway, I think, um, generally speaking, China has not made a fuss about the Indo-Pacific approach, the Indo-Pacific strategy neither of France, uh, Germany, or the Netherlands, their strategies, nor of the European Union. And it's generally been welcomed. And I have there a quote from uh, Prime Minister Kishida. I think it was the day after the strategy was launched, uh, welcoming uh, European um, and US uh, participation in the region. And that should be it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, um, it has, you touched upon a, a wide range of issues with regard to uh, uh, involvement and the potential involvement of uh, uh, European nations in uh, uh, Asia Pacific. I would like to ask uh, uh, a first question uh, uh, using a prerogative of a moderator. Um, you know, uh, there are, I think in general, United States and Japan welcome uh, European strategic interest in the region. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, you also pointed out uh, uh, some of the uh, concerns or, or, or difficulties, uh, such as uh, uh, limited uh, resources that uh, a European country has, and you have uh, uh, issues on the home front vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And if I may add some others, uh, 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 it looks like uh, uh, even definition of uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific region uh, is not uh, uh, clearly uh, shared uh, with uh, Japan and the United States uh, in that uh, uh, map that uh, uh, EU uses, uh, west coast of the uh, United States is not even on the, on the map. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, apart from uh, uh, France, other uh, EU nations uh, don't really have a, a permanent uh, base and the footprint is small and so on and so forth. Do you think, uh, 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 you know, there is a realistic uh, uh, involvement, particularly on the, on the side of uh, uh, security, peace, and stability uh, on the part of uh, Europe? Uh, I remember uh, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, uh, Lloyd Austin said in Singapore last year that, uh, uh, in essence, uh, Europeans should focus on the uh, European theater rather than uh, uh, try to do uh, what he may not be uh, uh, capable of doing. Thank you. I think it's, it's uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Akimoto, for the question. Um, well, of course, the first thing to say is that uh, our involvement is wide, wide ranging. Um, and security is only a part of it, although it's an important uh, underpinning, let's say, of, for us to achieve uh, many of our other policy objectives. So um, I think it's also, the definition of geographic definition, I'm speaking here, of course, uh, no longer as a European Union official, as I have been, of course, all the way through here. Um, obviously, this is a lot to do with strategic autonomy, the concept of strategic autonomy, uh, and the wish that uh, the European Union tries to uh, deal with different regions of the world, you know, based on its own uh, interests. Uh, but however, in close liaison with um, the United States. And therefore, you find that, as I said before, the interesting sequence that you have is the strategy is adopted, then there is a dialogue in the US on the Indo-Pacific, and then the French are calling everybody together, partners in the Pacific, excluding US, excluding China, yeah. uh, to have that dialogue. So there is close coordination, but a separation, which I think is, is, is important to give the Europeans a bit of breathing space uh, to be able to create their policies um, in liaison, of course, with other like-minded countries. Now, of course, yeah, you can say, and I agree with you, you know, we don't have much of a Navy except for the French now. Of course, there is strong desire for continued cooperation with the British. 
uh, and that the French have the, the footprints there and naval assets down there. Well, that's what we have. But the thing is this, well, first of all, one of our member states is down there, and that means that the other 26 have to take an interest. If there was absolutely no member state there, that'd be a different story. Um, uh, you know, because there's this mutual assistance, of course, that we all help each other uh, if, if, if difficulties arise, uh, arise as well. And of course, the French also have 7,000 uh, military uh, down there as well, um, including those um, military exercises that occurred between Japan and, and France. So it, because one of our member states is involved, then we all have to be involved. But of course, bearing in mind the uh, sensitivities of, of Russia and so on that we have to have most of our naval forces, you know, in the European theatre or just outside into the Indo-Pacific and Northwest uh, Indian Ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce a question from an uh, uh, anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, are there plans to increase coordination among EU and Indo-Pacific countries on space safety and security, sharing the space surveillance information or data? There is, um, there is in the strategy an uh, aspect on satellites, um, but there is nothing said on that subject. It's more to do with the EU satellite system, Galileo and Copernicus, and, and cooperation on existing systems at the moment. But everything is open for discussion. And in fact, I would say this as well, by the way, that as soon as the strategy had been launched, two countries came to the European Union saying, okay, we've got to We've got some ideas we'd like to you know, cooperate with you on, because as I said, it's a sort of palette. You know, we have all these areas. It's basically all the areas you can think of. Um, come, and, come and tell us what you're interested in. And so it was India uh, that came to us on ocean governance and, and Japan as well. Uh, so if there are new aspects that should be covered, then they should be put on the table uh, for discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to take up a question from uh, uh, Mr. Jim Schoff. Jim? He is a senior director of uh, uh, US-Japan Next Alliance Initiative at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm just joining here. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, thank you very much, George, for, uh, for that presentation. Uh, very interesting. And I wanted to ask a question uh, that builds on something you already talked about a little bit. But you know, clearly, there's tension between this idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific or what the US is pursuing in that, that way and, and some of the parts of the EU strategy and some of the, uh, the economic policies. We're struggling mightily on the U.S. front with the what is the Indo-Pacific economic framework and how do we reconcile our foreign policy goals with the domestic politics. And the same is true, I think, on the, the standards uh, uh, on the technology side. You know, we tried to promote this idea of the alliance for the future of the internet and, and, and setting certain high standards on the technology front that almost force certain uh, countries and companies to choose. Uh, either the China side of things or, or the US or the, the Western side of things. And I wonder if the, the crisis in Ukraine uh, and tension with Russia will even exacerbate that in terms of the financial decoupling and, and concern in, in, in China to uh, uh, maintain their own autonomy and, and reduce vulnerability uh, to, to outside pressure. So I guess my, my question is to ask if you could go a little deeper in terms of how the European side reconciles some, it must be very difficult internally to, to reconcile some of the, the domestic priorities um, with these international goals and, and, and broad free and open goals. And yet still, as you say, the third way to, to be a less uh, demanding or to be a more uh, accommodating uh, presence in the region. How, how, how have the Europeans kind of reconciled uh, I think I think the um, I think when we are sort of the non-threatening, that's referring to security, where we want to try and have as much cooperation as possible uh, with those, and and and, and enhance the sovereignty actually of, of many of the smaller countries that just want to stand their own feet and, and look after their own future. 
I think um, that's what we want to do. So on the so on the security front, we're sort of out of that, and we're looking for friendship and, and so on and so forth. And while nonetheless uh, cooperating with the like-minded in terms of maybe going a little bit deeper into things. Um, but when it comes to the other areas, of course, we are actually promoting our agenda, uh, which is the world agenda in the sense that you know you want to stop climate change or reduce the impact of climate change. Um, then, then you may find that some countries like Indonesia and Malaysia are saying, well, you're imposing your standards on us, you're imposing your values on us, because they're talking about palm oil, which is a big friction point, actually, between, uh, between the EU and, and some of the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN partners, unfortunately, unfortunately. And interesting enough, we sort of said, um, we gave the reasoning that it's our, you know, the, we are buying the stuff, and uh, therefore that's why we're saying that this palm oil that uh, it should be produced in a kind of sustainable way or that there should be less de deforestation anyway to say in short i think that of course we subscribe to the free and open uh, so it is important for us uh, to uh, have uh, uh, freedom in 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 the digital uh, sphere as well the digital sphere is very important because it is also it is not just the future but it is also less expensive than building heavy concrete infrastructure. So it's something that we want to be in uh, in, a, in a big way. So in all those areas, I think we are sort of, we are taking sides, of course, we have taken sides. Uh, and therefore, and what we'd like to do, and we wish we could find a way is to persuade China not to feel that it has to create its own system. And I think that's one of the big challenges we have. Uh, maybe it's too late now. Um, but if we could only say that China has a place in our system and we come to some kind of agreement, uh, unlikely as it may be, um, that would be the best for us. But at the moment, it seems we're going down a two-system avenue. But say that the norms and standards are the ones that I think we will accept, except, of course, it's the European, the details of the European one that we are, of course, promoting. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to pose a question uh, from Mr. Tomohiko Taniguchi, a cabinet officer under uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe's uh, uh, cabinet. Uh, he's wondering whether if you could share your observation about EU-Japan strategic partnership agreement, the political document that backs the EU-Japan economic partnership agreement. I know uh, Prime Minister Abe was keen on forging that agreement, a declaratory document that EU and Japan as two democratic pillars of Indo-Pacific region do as much as they can to enhance collaboration. Is it not time now for EU and Japan to put that document to practical use to pursue cooperation as regard, as regard to Ukrainian crisis? Well, I think as we face this Ukrainian crisis, um, I think if Japan were to come up with offers, we already had, of course, a sanctions package, which would be very supportive. Um, other offers of assistance and ideas, I think that would be welcome. Uh, I think we put the uh, strategic partnership already, if you have seen the slide, uh, the amount of things we are doing with Japan is quite considerable. But if there's more to put on the table, I think everybody is very keen to listen. And of course, I'm not an official anymore, but this is just from knowing the system. Um, please put it on the table. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ambassador Kurt Tong and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Miyoshi, a uh, former journalist at the uh, Ayomiuri, has uh, uh, essentially the same question. So I'm going to read uh, Ambassador Tong's question. People are questioning the US ability to sustain Indo-Pacific strategy amid the rising threat from Russia. Could you comment on the situation for the EU? In the Indo-Pacific? Hmm. Correct, whether they can uh, uh, sustain uh, Indo-Pacific strategy uh, facing the threat from uh, uh, Russia. Well, everything's changing by the hour. We have to see how things develop. We have to see if, um, that President Putin stays in power at the end of the day, because I'm sure there is mounting anxiety as to the way that things are developing. And if he doesn't stay in power, I think there should be a, um, an open hand uh, towards Russia by the West to not make what people say perceived to have been a mistake of 1989 
uh, in which it was perceived by the Russians that we um, didn't embrace them enough uh, to bring them into the West, Western system. Uh, that there was still, unfortunately, because it, communism had just broken, of course, a residue um, concern about the country and where it would go. And of course, it did go in the wrong direction again. But a little bit like Nazi Germany uh, after the Second World War, it will be a moment in which we will really have to try and bring Russia into, into the European family. So I think everything is um, very fluid, could turn very unpleasant, could be very, very dangerous for the whole world of security if it goes wrong. Um, but if we can turn this, um, this unfortunate situation into some kind of better situation for the stability of the world, we should try and uh, take it. Um, but at the moment, it's looking dire. I would say I cannot predict, therefore, how we should, should be uh, treating Russia in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, one person uh, asked about uh, uh, European energy strategy. That uh, um, was there, uh, has there been uh, too much reliance on uh, uh, Russia on energy? And also uh, uh, hastily uh, uh, pushing forward uh, uh, this green uh, uh, strategy? Okay, so yes, first of all, total over-reliance, I guess, because it's the cheapest uh, place to get it. And the building of this Nord Stream 2 pipeline to supplement Nord Stream 1 pipeline uh, in order to pump even more gas into, into Europe. The commentators from Japan are saying that um, Nord Stream 2 is permanently blocked. Um, that's not what the Chancellor, as far as I know, has said, uh, but that is the feeling because indeed one has to look for other places and the other places, of course, we're getting uh, uh, oil, um, gas supplies from Algeria and from Norway and from the United States. And of course, there's a good opportunity for the United States to come in and sell, sell more gas uh, into Europe. So take advantage um, because we must really close down our dependency. Um, uh, to, towards Russia in this respect, or close it or reduce it substantially. So I think uh, that's been learned. You have the Greens who are in coalition in Germany. Uh, they're dead against nuclear power, but um, that's something that's been wrapped up by France. France is increasing its nuclear power. It's a pity that the Greens are objecting. I know it's not perfect, but it's a lot better in terms of greenhouse gases than uh, you know, fossil fuels. Uh, but the Germans took the decision to close down all the nuclear plants. Um, and then uh, finally, there is um, uh, the fact that the Greens are there. So, of course, uh, the green um, change is, is, is going to be underway in, in uh, there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you've been very generous with your time uh, uh, explaining the situation in the uh, EU uh, with regard to its uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, as you it's said, the uh, uh, situation uh, has been evolving uh, very quickly and geopolitical uh, elements on the European uh, uh, continent is also uh, uh, taking dramatic uh, uh, turns. Uh, as I said, uh, we, uh, 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 we have just started uh, publishing uh, uh, eight papers on the European involvement in the, in the Pacific. And uh, I really uh, uh, thank you for uh, your cooperation in uh, uh, creating uh, uh, this uh, uh, paper series and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, continue to uh, work with you. Um, Mr. Cunningham, if you have uh, uh, one final word, or uh, uh, you have a final word. Okay, just to simply to thank once again, um, all like-minded partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the wider Indo-Pacific, if you like, including the United States, uh, for the great cooperation, um, both now and also when it comes to Ukraine. Thank you again. It's been much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.